Hey everybody, JD here and welcome to a special edition of the Fish with JD TV show and tonight, ah, well you see I have a kind of a blurry background um, because to me that's a little bit of what the good salmon fishing in California looks like, it's blurry in the rear view mirror. So uh, anyway, we're going to talk all about salmon and uh, and the drought and just all the effects of all this stuff going on right now and joining me will be James Stone president of NorCal Guides and Sportsman's because he is on the front line of all this stuff right now. And we're going to get Bob Spar on here, a fishing guide. We're going to get Mark Smith, our lobbyist, and uh, hmm, I think somebody else. Um, anyway, before we get started, just remember that if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, down below there's comment section and we're going to, uh, if you have questions about the drought, fish populations, the status of the runs, uh, any of that good stuff, Feel free to uh, let your fingers do the walking, and um, we will try to get to you as quickly as possible. So, without further ado, let's bring in my man, Mr. Stone. How are you this evening? Hello, everybody. How are you guys? Well, I'm thinking there's two thumbs up, so at least two of them are doing well. <laughs> so, anyway, um, well, let's just jump into it. I mean, we're going to cover the salt water, the fresh water, the river conditions and and you know things aren't looking super great but let's start with a bright spot right now and let's talk a little bit about the fishing in the pacific ocean right now off of california generally speaking they are doing very well on kings and um that kind of i don't know hopefully doesn't lead to a little false positive which i, I kind of feel like it will um, because a lot of those fish, as you well know, James, have been trucked and they don't really find their way back as well to the uh, the freshwater systems. And so we can get really good fishing out in the ocean. And, and we all, you know, fingers crossed that that's going to relate uh, to good fishing in the fall upriver in the freshwater. However, that isn't always the case, is it? No, it's not always the case. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's there's a lot of education that needs to be done with uh, what happens when you truck our hatchery fish and what happens when a system is, you know, the government's willing to admit 75 to 80 percent of all harvest um, in the ocean and inland and spawning. I would say it's higher than that just to be uh very cautious, but uh, it's much, much higher. And so when you make mistakes with management and you mismanage the resource or you have to make drastic decisions that cause drastic repercussions three years later, then it, it can be a problem. And trucking is not the ultimate solution to okay. solving anything salmon it should be used as a disaster like we did this year um, and to save fish, but it should not be used as a generalized practice with our mitigation fish. However, we are firm believers in enhancement fish to go out to the, del to the uh, Western Delta and net pins to support a healthy ocean fishery for all. Yeah. So, um, as far as the ocean goes, I was hoping we could get uh, a saltwater guy on to uh, talk about uh, conditions out there. I mean, yeah. uh, I've seen the pictures from the party boats. Those fish are looking healthy and fat and uh, some pretty good sized ones. So there must be some food out there now. Uh, one of the guys I played baseball with uh, has a bait wholesale company down in the Bay Area. And he said there aren't any anchovies around. So I don't know if that means there's nobody out commercially harvesting anchovies or if there aren't any anchovies in general out of our coast but if there's not i'm not sure what they're eating because it sounds like the krill has kind of be up, been up and down the last few years the sardines are sort of a wall so i gotta believe they're eating eating anchovies have you heard anything about any of that yeah I, actually i have and i know that we reached out and johnny atkinson from the pfmc charter boat and new ran sport fishing he was going to come on um if we had more of a timeline for him we i know we kind of decided to do this last minute um yeah. just because of everyone's schedules being hectic right now um and everybody's bouncing all over fishing multiple states trying to survive <laughs> yeah. um so uh 
with that being said, he wanted to be here. He gave me a statement to read. Um, and I can kind of just cover yeah. that of what he sent. Uh, sure, let's hear but, what the report is. Yeah. Johnny said, let's see. If and can... new Ryan, where's he operating out of Sausalito? He's Sausalito. Yeah. Johnny is out of Sausalito. Um, I'm trying to find it where I saved it. Um, <laughs> He basically, I'm just going to paraphrase because I can't find it right off the yeah, top of my fine. head. But Johnny and I talk a lot. Um, you know, he's a great advocate for his industry, for his fleet. And um, he does everything he can to fight for the charter boat fleet. And they've got a great association down there, Golden Gate Fishing Association, which is the, I believe, the main 34 main charter boats and then a bunch of six pack boats. Um, that operate um, out of uh, basically Monterey-ish, um, San Francisco, Sausalito areas, um, and then also Bodega. I know it covers Bodega, and I think some of the fleet is trying to get help from, from everywhere on the coast of California because we're all suffering. Um, but, you know, I mean, you've got to look at this into context. I think that too many people take it out of context, especially things that, you know, statements that I might said Um you know, I've got a lot of pushback from a lot of people about comments that I made to the state legislatures last Tuesday um, under a context of modeling and um, of, of what I said. And I'm going to put the slide up for everybody in a minute. But uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the way that we accurately forecast and the way that we model our abundance is not probably the best way. Uh, to ensure that we have healthy fisheries. Um, but I, I want that to be said with a grain of salt because we all know that we have major water problems. Right. And, I mean, that are just, you know, and it's, it's like building a house on a faulty foundation. If you don't have stability with your water flows, you're going to have no stability with your salmon populations. Right. And, and so, um, we, we have those issues. And so that's why our group has been screaming to raise more hatchery fish, because that's all we think that we can do at this point, because there will be no concessions as far as um, certain protections that would even possibly help. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think of one thing that, you know, would really help if everyone could get behind it. And that would probably be sustainable flows from the months of September <laughs> through December yeah. where you have one flow. So instead of up and downs, we've just got a sustainable flow and preferably as cold as possible yeah. until the hot water or until the hot days, the temperature of the day cools down and the nights and starts getting below 60 degrees. And once that happens then the earth starts to cool the ground starts to cool, the rocks don't heat up as much, and the rivers start to get healthy and ready for accepting of, of salmon reds. Yeah. Um, and, and there can be successful spawning in this system of all of, of fall run and late fall for sure. Um, I think that we're working in areas to have better opportunity for spring run, which used to be the largest population on the Sacramento River. Mm -hmm. and um, was a sustainable stock for their southern resident killer whales as well. Um, but um, that stock has been completely depleted um, because of the way that we've dynamically changed uh, the water flows. But getting back to the ocean, uh, everything is so connected, but getting yeah. back to the ocean, you know, Johnny's statement out there was that fishing has been since the opener of June 26th. He said that the uh, fishing uh, out of San Francisco and Bodega has been about a fish and a rod to limits almost every trip, every wow. day. Wow. So it's been at least, um, you know, six pack boats are at least bringing in six fish to 12 fish a boat. Yep. And um, most of the bigger charter boats, I think with the COVID restrictions are running 13 to 18 people. So they're bringing in 26 uh, fish, you know, maximum on the 13 man loads to 36 fish on the 18 man loads when their normal loads used to go up to about 30 people, I believe, or 20, 27, right. 20, 26, 27. So um, they are having a decent. Um, yeah, that's pretty uh, solid. 
Summer. Yeah, a decent summer. Now, you know, you got to remember they lost their whole April, their yeah. whole May, yeah. and almost all of their June fishery completely got wiped out because of the new modeling um, from the Pacific Fisheries Management Council because my statement that was the truth that everyone bugged out on me on, but the model was changed because we were over harvesting according to the model. Mm -hmm. And so when that happened for seven consecutive years, the salmon technical team, which consists of CDFW staff, NOAA fishery staff, and other very smart, intelligent people that collectively work to the best of their ability to manage the stocks determined that they cannot allow the current commercial or recreational fleet, including charter on the ocean for as many days as they were in the previous model, because we are just getting too darn good at catching fish in the time that keeps getting cut down right. on, on <clears throat> all of us in every industry. And so the commercial fleet has been just done, you know, just, destroyed over the last 20 years, as you yeah. know. Yep. yep. And the charter fleet is getting destroyed. They're surviving because of other multiple species management. And the recreational fleet is doing good because of net pens and trucking since 2007. It has built this illusion that Sacramento natural spawning stocks have created a healthy ocean fishery when in fact we have an ocean that is full of salmon but majority of those salmon are not going home where they're supposed to go home yeah eventually that doesn't work out right and so that's why i made the comment that trucking is not the ultimate solution do i feel that we should raise smolts for the commercial fleet and truck them to Fort Baker? Yes. Yeah. Do I believe we should have net pin programs out on the ocean? Yes. And I think we all do. I think we all want to support our ocean fisheries and our fleets and our charter boats and our recreational resources out there. But we also have to look at that dynamic about the inland factor and getting back to sustainable natural spawning stocks. And if you're not going to give them water to spawn, then you must mitigate for that loss right? because you have a dam there that's blocking their normal passage to habitat that yep. would be successful. Right. And so therefore, in lieu of dam and no water, you must mitigate for that. And if they came out and said, listen, it's a drought, guys. We're going to double the fish this year, triple the fish this year and try to help then I think everyone wouldn't be as bummed out. But when you get when you get to certain individuals on certain systems and not putting any blame on anyone, but there are individuals that want to help and we thank you. Um, and we're looking forward to the conversation to try to raise more fish and to do that. Um, more of you need to speak up and uh, tell your bosses that it's the right thing to do. Well, because that's, all, that's all we have left. Yeah, on that note, we actually asked a couple of uh, uh, state employees who are in the know to come on, and they, they would love to. However, they said they can't. They can't. And, and this is the part that really rubs me wrong. So we have some people who know about what's going on, and they can't speak because of fear. You know, they, they have to go through the channels and get a, approved, and we have to submit the questions first. And I'm thinking... You know, and I, I totally understand them not coming on. It's their job. So that's, you know, that, this is on their bosses. This isn't on them. That last time I checked, we, we the people, pay the salaries of government employees. And government is withholding, not that that's anything new, but the government is withholding information from us. Again, it's not these employees because they're they're told that they can't do it unless they go through all these channels. But there's something wrong with that. And it makes you instantly, uh, you know, my, my my parents taught me to uh, be a, a little uh, suspicious of, uh, of government and, and, you know, question everything. And, and that's the kind of stuff that makes you go, OK, 
So what is it you don't want us to know? So uh, anyway, that's aside. So uh, I guess the bottom line is the ocean right now is doing well. It's again, it doesn't mean we're going to have banner years in the river but let's shift up not, like it, not like it used to not like right, it used to right yeah i remember when... <laughs> back in the day in the, the early 2000s oh my gosh yeah you, know, you look down in the the san, Di or san diego <laughs> well they were catching them too probably <laughs> but the yeah, yeah. san francisco boats the uh you know monterey boats all those guys and, and they would catch them down to avila beach and further south in those years i remember used to hack me off because <laughs> Guys in Southern California were catching our kings. I'm like, you're taking our water and our kings now? Hey. But there were so <laughs> many. And, you know, party boats out of the out of the bay with this, those big, huge charter boats, charter boats with 30 people on them would do three trips a day. And they're just whacking them. And then when they were doing that, though, we're like, <laughs> here we go, because they're coming our way. And they they never there were so many fish that all that effort out there didn't affect us at all. And I'm sure and I wasn't really no. aware of it, but I'm sure the. Uh, the commercial guys were whacking them too. the, you know, commercial salmon guys offshore. So the party boats, the sport fleet, everybody offshore was whacking them. And we, we had tremendous runs, as you know, like 2002, we had 700 and some odd thousand Chinook up the sack system. So um, just because they're whacking them down there nowadays, doesn't necessarily mean we're going to whack them because there's, there's some right. weird things we just talked about, but net pens and trucking have given us this illusion that the, right. the fishery is really healthy, but it's not. Um, it's, it's, it's that illusion. We support right. it, but we still need to fix the yeah. inland side of things. Well, right. And, and nothing works if, if, I mean, there'll be no fish to raise at some point if the inland doesn't get fixed, I think, right. I think before we get too sidetracked, I think um, terminal fisheries like at Humboldt Bay, Crescent City, Bodega, all those places would be awesome. But you have some uh, nervous Nellies that are afraid that Chinook are going to stray into some little creek like Lagunitas Creek at the head of Tomales Bay where they're going to, uh, you know, take over the creek and spawn and, and outdo the native coho population, which is horse hooey because – they, they spawn at different times. They spawn in different areas. But anyway, so let's let's not get down too far down the rabbit hole. So the ocean, so far, so good. Now, the so river, far, so good. Everything's looking good. You asked about krill. There is anchovy, but they're in certain areas down south. But mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of reports off the deep reef of a lot of krill and a lot of people saying that the krill production was great this year. So oh, you good. should see a lot of really orange, bright fish oh, good, good, um, good. as they make their ways into the rivers. Um, so, um, and, and one thing that I, I guess we failed to mention is, uh, and it's a little, it's a, it's different, but related the, um, and this actually really illustrates our point. So the KMZ, the Klamath management zone. So the Northern part of the state had a very limited King season this year offshore, and they had a piss poor one by all accounts. I mean, there was a few fish around, but, and, and I don't know if it's closed yet or not, but it's generally not been a very good, and it was forecast not to be very good. And they don't have the, uh, the you know, that the so Klamath, obviously, the Klamath Management Zone is the mainstream that supports all that. They don't have the trucking stuff going on. So you can really see where we didn't do that sort of artificial, um, it's not propagation planning, but, you know, okay. um, they didn't have any trucking going on there. And boom, no fish offshore down here. We kind of set up this artificial, um, you know, bright spot in a way. But anyway, so the sack just opened on August first. Up um, where where is it even open? I don't even above know. above Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Right, and so that's the barge hole section. And by all accounts, the opener was spectacular, um, or very good anyway. I heard some really good scores, and down through the canyon, uh, very good as well. And in fact, I thought I saw a comment here. Hang on. We're get, getting some people chiming in. Yeah. Uh, so Matty Oliva, who's a guide up there. Yeah, he's he's agreeing with us. He says the bright spot is, oh, well, here, I can put it up here. Uh, there were more fish caught up river yesterday than every year since 2015, which is very good. However, 2015 sucked, you know, in general go, compared to the, the old days. But um, and he says Coleman can't figure out why there's so many fish in the system right now. Between the barge hole and the canyon produced over 150 kings at opening day. That is awesome. Another 60 to 70 a day. So my take on that is, again, we're, we're talking sort of these false positives. 
And and this is, I mean, Maddie, I you know, I don't know, I'm not there, I'm not counting fish, but my concern with, I mean, that's that's great. I'm stoked you guys are catching fish up there. I mean, that's that's what everybody needs. We need, we we need want. A, yeah, we need a good salmon bite, and that's how it used to always be. But right. um, the concern would be because I, I talked to guys who fished Woodson on the opener, they fished you know 10 hours. These guys are good fishermen, they never saw fish roll, uh, never caught a fish. And and what so my this is kind of my hesitation is that all the fish ran up to the top. <laughs> yeah, my glass is half empty here. So, um, yeah, that the conditions suck down below because the water's low and warm. So they're all going to pile up into the upper end. And I hope I'm wrong about that because I hope, you know, that's just the beginning of a great season for you guys up there. But I, I'm also, I don't know, I, I guess a bunch of these crappy salmon years that we've had over the you know last decade have made me a little cynical, but I certainly hope uh, I am wrong and that you guys whack them up there all season long. And I, no one would be happier than me, but um, just, just, I don't know, I guess guarded optimism would be the, the safe play there. Yeah. But, when uh, I talked to, when I talked to the fish counters yesterday, they said they had 73 Kings by 1 PM. So I don't know how many checked in in the afternoon and there was like 30 downstream. So my numbers were a little bit lower than Maddie's of total Kings caught. Um, I was told that it was right around like 110, maybe about 120, but that's still far and better between um, what we saw, like he said, over the last six, seven years. Yeah, that feels um, like all seasons total. <laughs> yeah, true. yeah. It's, I so. mean, that's good. And, and I, I haven't heard that there were 70 fish caught today. Um, I was told different reports today, um, but I was told there was you know not as many fish caught today as there was yesterday. But with yeah. that being said, We'll see what happens over the next couple yeah. of weeks. We'll yeah. see if, if there's sustainable fishing and, you know, top guides are still bagging a fish or rod, then that's a great sign. If yeah. it starts dwindling down quickly, then we're going to possibly be looking at what we feared. And that was um, that thiamine possibly had a huge effect on our natural mm. spawning stocks. Here we go and again with that. Yeah. Re, well, this is the year that they were supposed to uh, come back and uh, you know, we'll see what happens. I mean, there's also a phantom 135,000 fish from last year that went vanishing out of the sack system off the model. 135,000 just whoo, guys are so on us. So maybe those will come back this year and maybe yeah. the rivers will pile in with three, 400,000. That would be awesome. <laughs> Apparently the fish don't uh, always follow the model. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't get the memo. Don't they? <laughs> oh my gosh. So uh, but, let's, let's, uh, we got some people chiming in here. So, oh, thanks sure. Maddie, for that, by the way. Um, yeah, it's a good uh, pivot into the river fishery and yep. what's going on. Uh, show regular James Kramer asked how many salmon we have this year total in all the rivers that's that's a good question james and i think we're kind of alluding to that right now we don't know um the forecast um, is uh, not not real good um but only time will tell and and the forecast is exactly that it's a forecast there's models there's forecasts and i know we beat these people up a lot about their forecasts and their models but in their defense i will say that how do you accurately predict how many salmon are out in the Pacific Ocean? I mean, that's 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 a task that I wouldn't want to have to take on. And so, and, and you know way more about it than I do going to all the PFMC stuff. So I, I, I give them a lot of um, a lot of grace uh, air period there for uh, um, not getting it right because it is such a, I mean, yeah, you know, like you said, there's a hundred and some odd thousand that just disappeared off the map. So um okay let's see what do we got here I, let me answer that yeah, question according to the model uh the, the, i would just say the model when we did the pfmc when we modeled the whole system we had like two hundred and eighty thousand, i believe it was on abundance offshore. um offshore right. in the ocean and out of that two hundred and eighty thousand, we had to allow 151 000 to come back inland which was about uh, around 20,000, give or take 20,000 is just easy numbers for you to remember for harvest in the river, yeah. 20,000 adults leaving about 131,000 to spawn with estimated 22,000 of those going back to hatcheries and the balance going into natural areas. That's the way the model reads. Um, the minimum remember is 122. So there's estimated to be about 151 minus harvest, which will leave about 131. 
Um, that's still not a lot of fish. Remember, JD told you the beginning of this 2002, 775,000 fish escaped plus yeah. river harvest. <laughs> yeah, what was so, the what was the forecast that year? That'd be interesting to look back at the, that. 1.6 million abundance in the ocean compared like to they this got year. It pretty close that year. Yeah. Um, and this year we had 280,000 abundance, um, which starts to make you go, okay, well, that's easy. We need more fish. We got to raise more fish. Yeah. It's right. Just, you know, we're just not producing fish. We're not giving sustainable flows. We're not giving the correct natural spawning habitat. And you know, I, I think a lot of realists and people are given up or at least uh, conceded to the argument that, uh, you know, they're, the, you know, the lawsuits are, are, haven't got anywhere uh, sustainable in order to, you know, help the fish uh, mm -hmm. to the point to where they're going to be. And uh, both sides of the aisle have politically fought against each other. And we'll talk more about flows later. But, um, you know, it's basically come to a point to where, the only thing that really gets hurt in this whole scheme of things is the fish, the salmon. Right. They get destroyed in this, um, you know, political, you know, grab by both sides of the aisle and by all users, including you and me, and including everyone. We're all taking from the resource in order to have right. sustainable water. And we're going to talk about that in our second hour tonight about water and what that's going to mean for the future because of the drought and uh there's some scary times coming ahead well but, that's, that's a good uh good segue into uh lenore mercer's comment what are the plans looking forward to adapt to a warmer drier cl climate and that's a it's a damn good question because kind of from my you know a little bit outside looking in i feel like there aren't any real plans i mean they've just kind of you know, um, our director has presided for 10 years over these fisheries that have just gone, you know, and so, and that was, you know, we, we've had some good water conditions in those years too. And so uh, uh, do they have some sort of climate change uh, focus? I mean, I, I always thought going back to you know, when I first started guide in 98 on the American, uh, the Kings would come in in August and September was good. And October, you know, people say, when's the best time to come? I just say October. It didn't matter the first or the 31st. Just come in October. There's plenty of fish. Now they don't even show up until about the time the river closes in November. And so I remember thinking, I, I, I can remember seeing that kind of slowly creeping. It seems like it's accelerated to a later run. And, and we're seeing that everywhere. And and I, I remember well, quite a long time ago, actually, and not, not really thinking that this would come to fruition, but it'd be cool if they just started taking the later fish. Like, I think that's something they could do is, okay, let's just, it's a given that we don't have cold water in the summer anymore here. Like we used to in, in July in the feather, for example. So maybe we need to start taking those late fish and spawning those together um, to produce a run that comes in in December or whatever it is. I mean, that's what the fish would do on their own naturally. If, if they were presented with this, without any hatchery influence, they'd go, okay, only ones that are coming in later are going to survive. And so it seems like we could help them a little bit, but. Anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, <clears throat> another way to explain that, you know, just like what you said was, yeah, I mean, in normal times, if man wasn't interfering and the earlier fish were constantly going into bad conditions and they were dying generation after generation after generation. Well, natural selection takes over. Natural <laughs> selection takes over. And so the, either the fish are going to only come back late. And I, and I believe there's a lot of studies going on with this run timing gene right now. You're seeing it from the geneticists. You're seeing it out of Davis and Berkeley and the Pacific South, uh, Southwest Science Center from NOAA Fisheries. Uh, they're analyzing stuff up in Oregon and Washington as well. You're seeing this run timing gene issue, especially with spring run and fall run hybrid fish. And they're mm -hmm. calling it the sprawl. sprawl. Yeah. yeah, the sprawl fish. And now, you know, if they've got one genome of uh, spring run and one of, uh, you know, the fall run, then next thing you know, you have a fish that could go fall, could go spring. And just depends on the, that fish, um, which way they wanted to rock it instead of having spring, spring or fall, fall. So if that's the case, you know, we know there's tons of feather river fish like that, tons of them. 
Yep. And um, anyhow, so hopefully that helps. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I butchered your name there. We'll call you Lan, just in case that's I'm messing you up. But thanks for the questions. Uh, really, really pertinent uh, questions. Um, let's let's see what else we got going here. Um, let's see. Team McFishing, 73 to 77. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Got down at Ielton. Marks and fishing holes all the outgoing tide, but only yeah. Um, and and that that's the thing that really surprises me. Getting back to what Maddie was saying about how many fish were up there, I was thinking, you know, those things were up where he's fishing. So the Gianella Bridge there at Highway 32, I think, is River Mile 200 right there at Hamilton City. And so you know, Maddie and those guys are fishing another what 50 miles, 40 miles above that. And uh, so you're, you know, you're somewhere between two and 300 miles away from the sea. And if the fish can't hold at Hamilton city, they're running through that hot water for 200 miles. I mean, it's just yeah. amazing to me that these things can even uh, survive that. I mean, it's yeah. crazy. And, and on that note, going back to Klamath Trinity, uh, I looked yesterday and, and I canceled all my Trinity trips. For this year because the water temp at hoopa right now is 78 degrees on the trinity <laughs> like nothing i mean that's squaw fish don't even like that you know no. so ah brutal 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 yeah so, I, th I was gonna say yeah i think that uh, you're gonna see even hotter temperatures on the second half when we start talking the flows uh team mcfishing uh yeah. watch the second half of this program because we're gonna start talking about what's gonna happen and uh next month and next week and uh for august and september flows we've got the flows and we know what the numbers and so we know what the you know rough estimates on the temps yeah. are going to be then that's when it's going to get really bad right. and we're going to start seeing that's when the shizzles getting rizzle yo yeah. <laughs> so uh um before we get there because we're going to get to uh all the flows and kind of the outlook on uh on on water which uh, spoiler alert isn't real good, but, um, here's another, somebody, uh, Alsan Martinez was, uh, fishing the sack Metro at high tide on Wednesday, 76 degrees. I mean, good Lord. Thanks for that report. And that's what we're hearing is that there's a few fish down there maybe that are trying to move up the system, but, um, they're not going to snap because it's too hot. They're just trying to survive right now. Yeah. And <laughs> here we go. Our almond numbers up this year with the drought. Um, I think that question answers itself there, Michael. <laughs> All right. Which I think is your point. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I, you know, I, I'm going to respond to this. You know, we don't normally touch on a lot of things um, in Northern California. There's a lot of other, you know, there's a lot of small farmers and small, small, small uh, families that are just trying yeah. to survive as farming and they support I our grew communities. Up on <laughs> Yeah. And it's, and it's a good thing. And, um, I think that it's important that we support our local farmers and support them, um, and make sure that we have sustainable water for food, um, to feed Californians and many, and, and, and many other States. Um, you know, however, there are a couple of corporate interests that are large enough to drain an entire reservoir with two to three companies Right. And yeah, it's not the local guys, the small no, guys. it's not it's not the local farmers. And so some people give farmers a bad rap, but I want you to know that there's, you know, a very large company and then there's a large um, life insurance company um, that has the most almond trees, <laughs> almond trees in the yeah. Central Valley. And um, they're hedging billions and billions and billions of dollars. Um with life insurance policies against crops that are surviving on the backbone of a publicly trusted resource right. because they got negotiated deals for that resource at cheap rates. And then when the supply runs out, our farmers are forced to sell it to them so that their crops don't deteriorate completely and the end response of that is that it gives a bad outlook but when they yep. if they don't sell that water those big corporate ag interests will smash them and come after the family farms and take away their take water over. Yeah. and just take them over and so 
that's why you have this dynamic in the farming community that I don't want to dive too deep into, but right. that's the truth of the matter is that there's a big difference in farming interests between family farms in certain areas and huge corporate takeover interest of right. thousands and thousands of acres that are not doing it for the best interest of Californians, the resource or for the most part, giving back to, uh, you know, mitigate the effects of it. Well, there's a lot of local farmers too, that want to work with us and do work with us. And Great you, people. Got, you got the whole Nagiri project where the rice farmers are putting salmon out on their, on their fields. And I mean, you can work with the small guys and, and, and they grew up here. They know they fish, they hunt, right. they see it all. It's yep. like you say, it's these corporate kooks that, you know, probably never even been in Northern California, you know? Yeah. They don't even know where Yuba city is. Chico is Redding is they don't, they don't, they don't care. Um, we're not on their radar and, um, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it's, I'm not going to mention any names, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the truth of it right there. And <laughs> yeah. when you, when you get rid of about like five huge corporate interests, that's a whole nother Orville. That's how yeah. big of a deal it is. Yeah. I mean, that's Orville. Orville full, Reservoir. With not, five not companies. Yeah. That that, you know, and and you know, that's that's a lot. That's um a lot. one group uses half of Folsom Lake themselves on their own ranch every year. That's that's in that's half of Folsom. I mean, so yeah. you start to wonder about that. But we work, like JD said, hand in hand. We work with our local farmers that support our organization because we support them and our communities can sustain on one another, but we have to make sure that we're fighting together yeah. and that we are, we are with each other on this resource because uh, we're all suffering honestly because of a few. Right. Um, so Ken, <laughs> big money will always get the water. Yep. And Greg, Wall Street money funds, yep. And the politicians. It gets the politicians too. And yeah. it gets the votes. And when it gets the votes, um, you get the votes and you're and you're giving three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand to the elected officials. And even you might be given only to your favorite elected official in your district, but if he has, you know, his district locked up, then he's given to others on the same side of the aisle he is, whether it's Democrat or Republican, right. it doesn't matter on this issue. We all drink water. It don't matter what you are blue or red in this state, ladies and gentlemen, you drink water, you shower with water, you water your lawn, your swimming pools, you clean your pets. You plan on turning that faucet and water comes out of it every day. And the right. second hour, we're going to talk more about that, but yeah, yeah, we've got to get to sustainable flows. We got to get to sustainable storage too. Right. And and we've got to be real with ourselves on population growth. The housing industry is booming right now. They can't build homes fast enough. I know it. I know it. So, and I mean, I, I, you drive through Sacramento and look at all those new home starts and you think, so those homes come with their own uh, water, waste wastewater treatment plants, right? So they can reuse their, their own water because where's that coming from? Yeah, I mean, and and I don't mean to demean progress and and development because we need that too. But uh, I, I just you look at some of those places that over by my dad's house in November, uh, Natomas, they just they built like I don't know five thousand new apartments or something. And you go, well, those people all shower like you say, and you know drink water, and it's like, oh man. Yeah. But anyway, river, river fisheries are, um, you know, right. Like you said, getting back into kind of finishing up river fisheries, you know, I mean, we're excited. Uh, we've got uh, the central Valley open. I mean, we're excited that it's open, right? Yeah. I mean, we all remember when it was closed, so it could be worse, <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, but you know, we're not trying to be pessimistic. We're just being realistic with what's going to transpire over the next couple of months with waters and flows. But Right now, the fishing's there. I'm hoping that, you know, the interest still sparks and the fish keep coming. It's going to be a good thing. We'll see how that will uh, how that will work over the next full moon cycle. And we get the next push of fish. And, you know, typically, J.D., when did you normally see fish in the Sacramento and in the Feather uh, rivers, uh, you know, back in the 90s? 
Well, I would start the feather in July. Well, you, I mean, going further back, we would start in May and June, fish for springers. But right. um, I used to, after that kind of went away, I started going to Alaska. And so I'd get back from Alaska at the end of uh, the middle of July. And I'd hit the feather late July. And that was kind of springers and the first bit of fall run. And then all of August was good in September, you know, and then I would jump somewhere else. The sack, I remember clearly, I don't know why the numbers or the, the date sticks in my head, but uh, August 5th is usually when I would go to Hamilton City mm-hmm. between the, you know, the first week of August. Right. And um, and then that was over by, it wasn't over, but by first couple of weeks of September, they were getting dark. So then I'd pop over the Trinity or wherever I went next. But um, now it just seems like everything's so, you know, the seasons are shorter. They come in late. and um, it's just, it's a different deal. Um, here's another good question. We can go, we can go down a long, a long one on this one too. But, uh, Tammy asks, can you comment on how many government agencies have jurisdiction on the water process for water management? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And it's Bear. complicated. <laughs> Mama Bear Sanchez. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I heard that you got a fish with uh, ZZ Brock oh, in the opener. <laughs> oh, that's Sanchez. Yes, okay. it, yes, it is. Uh, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, thanks for watching tonight. Um, yeah, that's a great question, it and really a lot is. of a lot of people don't realize. And Mark Smith is going to come on and talk about the California Water Board and policy um, at eight o'clock sharp in about seventeen eighteen minutes. But uh, I can tell you that. The Sacramento River and the American River are two federal waterways that are managed by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, the federal government. Shasta Dam and Folsom Dam are federal dams, um, and they are owned and operated by uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation under FERC licensing. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to start from the beginning, we've got U.S. Bureau of Reclamation contracts 50 years to run Shasta Dam, and they are under the guidelines of FERC. So, um, so you have FERC regulating that dam operation. From there, when they release water, it is on state ground as soon as it leaves the dam, and then it becomes technical on the property or flowing over the property of state controlled land where the California state water board has jurisdiction and can curtail pumping rights or can dictate um, water users rights um, accordingly. Um, I think that we are going to start seeing some of that this year. And and a lot of people think that maybe I was exaggerating the last two months about the state of this drought, but I think it's all starting to come to light where people are going to start realizing there's going to be more issues. Getting back to the question at hand as it flows down, then it meets the Feather River, which is operated by a state agency, Department of Water Management, DWR. And they run the State Valley Project, the State Water Project, SWP. And the feds are running the CVPIA, which is the Central Valley Pro- uh, Project Improvement Act from 1992. Which, which was supposed had, to double our fish numbers. but Yeah, the doubling goals. That was supposed to double. We're going to fix everything and do all these other changes. And we're going to fix it all. And what they ended up doing seven years later after that is saying... No more fry program, reduce production in half. We only make half the hatchery fish. And uh, we now are going to ship more water um, out to the ocean, more water out to um, uh, diversion. And um, we are going to basically put everyone against each other and at each other's throats. Um, So uh, once the water gets (laughs) down through there, then it's managed by the Department of Water Resources. As the river then meets the American River, that's the federal waterway that comes back in again, and then it's managed by the Department of Water Resources and by the California State Water Board. 
Um, the state water board has a lot of power. Um, however, lawsuits fly in all directions um, over water and water rights. And I don't want to get too much into that. But uh, when it gets down to Sacramento, then you've got the Delta Cross Channel, which can get open and operated by the state of California. And that's for diversion towards the federal and the state pumps and Tracy. Um, and then you then get to Rio Vista and then it's managed by many different agencies and there's so much oversight and there's so much overlap between these agencies. Um, it just goes on and on and on and on. I mean, U S fish and wildlife, CDFW department of boatings and waterways. You start getting into, um, BLM, or as far as Bureau of Land Management, you start getting into um, uh, California State Parks. Um, so, yes, uh, I think the point, yeah, JD's head <laughs> is doing exactly what I think the question was alluding to, is that there are tons of red tape and regulation. Yeah. There's more so in California and on the West Coast than there are in other areas. Um, and sometimes this red tape and the regulation can lead to challenges on many different uh, sides of the aisle but simply as raising fish mm. takes years and years and years to get approved right well uh tammy uh i want you to read that back to us i want to know i want to see what you remembered give us exactly what the water does from starting at chasta down because <laughs> if you can do it i'll be impressed because I'm lost. <laughs> and I think everybody else is, and that's sort of the point. And, and maybe that's how they like it. So you can't kind of keep track. Excellent question. Thanks for, uh, thanks yeah, for that good question. And uh, let's see what else we got here. That, 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 uh, um, how are, oh yeah. Da, da. Well, I wanted to get to our old buddy Gravert. He, had, he says he had to bounce cause he's getting, uh, he's in Tennessee now. Here, here's, yeah. a story. here's another you know, everybody knows my story. I got out of the valley and moved to Tahoe to fish because, I, you know, <laughs> the way fisheries are going down in the valley. Uh, Michael, uh, Mike Gravert was a intimidator sport fishing, was a big Delta striper guy, salmon fisherman in California here in Sacramento Valley. Same deal. He moved to Tennessee because um, he had uh, where he said something else. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's just past his bedtime out there. But he, <laughs> he moved. Uh, he had to move too, and 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 that's kind of becoming the um, kind of the. I mean, your your boat's up for sale. I mean, there's just you know, yeah. it's a lot yeah, of yeah. My boat, my boat's for sale. My business is for sale. I'm I'm trying to sell my business. Um, you know, it's just it's crazy. Um, the 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 governments have let us down, and um. You know, there's nothing else to really say except the truth and what, you know, people need to hear. There's a lot of people that weren't around when fisheries were thriving yeah. and, you know, they catch a few fish and they see, you know, um, you know, 10,000 fish come back on a moon and they go, oh man, we got them. And, uh, you know, it's like we used to have 10,000 come a day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for 60, 70 days. Right. And, and I think about uh, guys like Jimmy Zinoco and Jerry Bass and Hank Mouts and all those guys that were before us. They, th they were thinking the same thing. Like these young punks don't know squad. This isn't good, you know? So, right. you know, I mean, <laughs> that generation saw even better fishing than, than I did. I mean, it's just, it's, it's been yeah. going downhill for a long time. I read a quote and I should have, should have, uh, you know, copied and pasted it, but it was from a uh, fish and game um, warden or biologist from late 1800s in California and said, you know, if we don't get, get onto this uh, fixing salmon problem, we're not going to have them soon. And they were saying that in the 1800s. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I mean, well, look at Scott Ferris senior who started our organization, you know, way back in 72 uh, when they were called West coast salmon and steelheaders. And they knew that we were going to have issues in 72 yeah. uh, when our organization started and then morphed into NorCal guides and sportsmen's and, you know, grew, grew from there and then fell apart um, after the last closure completely fell apart. And, you know, we finally were able to rebuild it just to see if we could try to fight uh, to the end to get it uh, sustainable again. Um, it's yeah. been too long and it's not, it's not right. Um, it's not right for the people. I mean, you take all the, you, you take all the commerce out of it, take all the commerce out of it, take all the guides out of it. Um, just take the recreational fishery 
you should have the right to have salmon in your rivers and be able to go recreate on the Sacramento feather and American rivers that are, should be healthy fisheries. Public you should be able to go. Resources. Yeah. You should be able to, to do that. And it's a huge failure to our people. And there were a few elitists that feel that, you know, uh, there's, there's, they're not going to fight for the water because they're being appointed to positions under, uh, you know, the governor that this is all on Gavin Newsom's watch and Jerry Brown's. Um, it's on both of their watches, but they are the people that, um, you know, failed us people. And now we're to the point to where, you know, can we save the last few remaining, right. you know, businesses that are even trying to operate? And the tired American is uh, is with you there. <laughs> He's <laughs> trying to convince me to vote no recall. Um, now, <laughs> going back, speaking of uh, Central Valley Guides, we got uh, Cameron Tucker here. And nice. uh, Maddie had a great question about tagging. Yeah, you have an answer? Oh, sorry. I missed, I missed that one. We got a bunch. I've been jumping around. Um, I know a lot of people don't understand the logistics behind that, where we get the data on these hatcheries. Okay, that's a good Good question. Let me uh, zip back and see what exactly Matt yeah. was asking. Thanks, Cameron. I I I can't see the comments either. Um, I'm on JD's the only one that can see them. But um, yeah, we'll we'll try to answer whatever we can on tagging. It's 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 going to be a complicated thing. Do different tagging systems for truck fish so we know which ones come back. Yes. So uh, that's a great question, Matt. Um, so. The way it works is that every single uh, CWT, which stands for code wire tag, um, that gets implanted in a fish at the minimum size of 150,000 per pound, or excuse me, 150 per pound. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm tired. Been on calls all day. 150 per pound compare up to 90 per pound when they go out as smolts. There's 90 fish in one pound of fish if you're going to weigh them. Yeah. But the the minimum size they can be is 150, preferably 120 per pound. But that's about the size that they have to be in order to get the code wire tag stuck in their head. Yeah, they got to be big a, enough so it doesn't kill them. Right, them. right. And so they go through the trucking system. And I've got a video when I visited the trucking system a couple years ago. And I will actually um, post that up for you right now, Maddie, too, so I can so everybody can watch that. Um, after I'll, I'll post it up right at nine o'clock, right. When we're all done tonight, that way you guys can watch that code wire tagging truck and how that process works. Cause it's really cool. However, we've allowed this code wire tagging system to basically control when we release our salmon and how we have to grow our salmon and how we have to manage our salmon. And it completely negates according to water policy. Right. It's like the polar opposites. It put it puts fish in the system at a time where they shouldn't be in the system unless they wanted to be in the system. Right. Um, and and so, what, what you're saying there, I, I think if, if I'm following you is that because they have to, to put the tags in them so they can figure out, I mean, the, the data I guess is useful. So let's, let's not, you know, ignore that part that from those coded wire tags, because it, when, when a fish is caught as an adult, that's, you know, when people, when the fish checkers come along, and they want your head when you've caught an adult, that's what they were trying to find is that coded wire tag. So they can see where that fish came from. Now, as James was saying, you, you have to let the fish grow, you know, whatever, yay big. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't put a little tag in some little, you know, fry's head that's that big because you're going to kill them. So you got to let them grow a little bit. Well, of course that means you're releasing them later, which typically means you're going to release them in hotter water, and more hostile water and usually it it coincides perfectly with the striped bass migration in the spring and so uh, you know one of the things we've been advocating for we being the norcal guides is to release these suckers be, be more flexible and they've worked with us a little bit here and there but um you know what happens is okay we're scheduled it's on a calendar april 14th is when we go and drop these feather river fish off at boyd's pump or whatever it is and we've been saying, you know, that one year where all the stripers were at Boyd's pump and we we're all guiding stripers and we called CDFW and said, please do not put them there because that's, I mean, we're fishing for stripers every day. We know where the stripers are and they're all right there. You're going to just lead the lambs to slaughter. And so I think right. that year they, they, they worked with us a little bit, but one of the things we've been advocating for is be a little more flexible. If you get a high water event, 
and it's a week before you're supposed to let them go, just let them go in the mud. They're much better uh, able to survive in high water flows. Right. It's murky and turbid and blah, blah, blah. So um, that's, I, I think I, I took it from you there, but that's, that's what you're kind no, of. No, you're good. I'll, 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 I'll rally off yours and re-answer the question again from Matt. Um, so yes, we do have a different code wire tag system. It's the same tag. When it goes into their head, it has a unique code on the tag and those digits are are uh, according to where they were released what time they were released how many were in the release group um, and all of those things are documented and you can read all about that in the code wire tag books that is done and led by brett cormos in the ocean salmon project um and which he's leaving that's that's going to be sad news um, but, um, we, um, you can read all about that. We have posted those to our website. I'm constantly trying to add stuff to our website too, Maddie. So if you go to science docs on our website, I'll bet you, you'll find about 30, 40 new articles there that I've posted up at ncgasa.org and the code wire tag reports from 17 and 18 are there and you can open that up and you can scroll down. And you can see, and I think JD and I did it on the last time we did one of these. We talked about trucking, remember? And we put those charts up with the yep. GG at the end, stood for Golden Gate when those right. were the Fort Baker releases. Right. Right. And that's how the codes are read on the code wire tags, Matt. And so it's a great question. Remember, all fall run are 25% clipped, at post fin clipped. So if we're raising 12 million fish at Coleman, and we're only clipping 3 million of those fish, why do we have to make the other 9 million wait to go out with them? Why can't we just clip the 3 million, study the 3 million, let those 3 million go wherever you want to do, yeah. but let's raise a whole bunch of other fish and let's let them go out sooner because we know that's what's right. But we have now put all of our hatchery fish subjected to this code wire tag management system and coinciding with the opposite of the way we've hybridized the water flow system because all the water starts coming in May and June instead of going out in March, February, and March, and April. And if we have a dry year, then we run into problems again with hatchery fish. And as we explained in the beginning, hatchery fish are making up of 80 to 90% something percent of all of our fish right yeah. i mean yeah probably probably higher realistically and so uh we know the value and importance of these hatchery fish and so yes that's a great question and remember all late falls are clipped a hundred percent so if you catch a late fall it's going to be clipped um and then winter runs are 100 percent clipped on the sacramento river out of livingston stone and they have a left vent clip as well on a winter run um so um you know there's there's also 100 percent clipping of the spring run on the feather river mm -hmm. and um the fall runs are 25 percent on the feather river and 25 percent on the american river as well and then there are a couple of programs from mccallamy hatchery that are 100 percent clipped when they're pilot programs or projects so they can try to get enough results back yeah. for data collection yeah um I just I got my phone up here, but I can't get to it. So somebody, it might have been Maddie, just texted me with a question. So that was that was a five three zero number, and it went by real fast. So um, and my camera or my phone is acting as my camera right now, so I can't go back. So whoever texted me a question, go ahead and uh, throw it. Uh, or text uh, me, and I can yeah, I can read it. <laughs> right. um, okay, so uh, here we go. Seattle crime gal. Oh. I want to know what, what crime you're into, but uh, uh, hatcheries are sustainable. I like that's, that. that. That's we should make shirts, yeah. Let's say that, yeah. I are like, we allowed to use that? We'd like to, we'd yeah, like to, we'd like to use that. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you credit, um, because that's that's a good one. That's is a that really a flower? Good. Is it a pink flower? Is it like a teddy bear with a red stomach I, or something? I think it's uh, I think it's uh, I'm blind, I'm old. Yeah. <laughs> She's uh she's not a criminal herself. <laughs> she's true crime. Whoops, where'd it go? 
True crime. Huh? Wow. Well, that's uh, awesome. Okay, we'll take your word for it. But that is hey, that is great. How, how is Seattle doing? Are you guys surviving up there? I hope you guys are doing well. Be yeah, safe. For sure. Um, uh, da, 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 here's another good one from Jesse Bible. Any spawned hatchery? Uh, huh, yeah. That um, here, the answer pretty much is no. Um, they in Oregon, they found uh, they've done studies on these streams where the salmon runs have not um, been doing well. And they notice all the other fish that live in the rivers are suffering, say rainbow trout or cutthroat or whatever. And so they've been seeding um, these streams with with dead hatchery fish. And they found that the productivity goes up. No S really, you know, it's like, and we can't get that going here. And again, if you want to, um, I know I'm always, always, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I got to go to the brands. Where are they? Uh, banners. Here we go. If you want to know more, I think I have it still. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Go yeah. to our movie unspawned on YouTube and uh, you'll see why we don't do that. And the short answer is, because it's really, really stupid that we don't do it. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. Unspawned is in the video. And it uh, looks like, gosh, our man, Mark Smith, who uh, was perfectly on time. We were a little little behind schedule. So sorry, Mark. We're going to add him to it. We're going to get into some, uh, some water uh, policies and flows and good stuff like that. So welcome, Mark. Thanks for tuning in or joining us. I guess you're not tuning in. You're chiming in. But uh, and and Mark is uh, the, the Smith Policy Group, right? Yep. Yep. OK. Just making sure you could hear us. And uh, he's also the lobbyist for uh, several outfits, including uh, NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association. So he's our our link down to the Capitol, our insider, if you will, who uh, kind of really coaches us and guides us on things um, where we may just go in there and start um, stomping and cussing and cursing. And Mark uh, kind of leads us uh, back into, uh, you know, that's uh, if you want to get some stuff done, boys. Uh, so he's, he's not a fishing guy, but he guides fishing guides. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so anyway, welcome. Uh, welcome, Mark. And uh, so, um, James, I wanted to and, and I, I think this is this helps tie Mark into as well, but um, uh, let's, let's talk about the river flows and the expected, uh, I guess they're not even expected unless they're pretty much set in stone now, unless we get some sort of uh, biblical rain, but uh, give us the, the, what the flow regimes are going to look like in the central Valley rivers coming up here. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, I'll pivot, you know, uh, into Mark uh, talking about, um, you know, what's going to transpire here in the next couple of uh, weeks, but um, especially tomorrow. But uh, yeah, we're going to start seeing the drop down flows from the amount of supply of uh, and demand that, that, you know, the demand is high right now for water. Um, but the amount of supply that is available is diminishing to the point to where there's heavy concerns of now. Um, holdover storage for the following years. And so when you um, start getting to these levels of storage in Shasta, Orville, and Folsom in particular, um, and Trinity, you start getting to these lower historic averages. Um, you might be able to pop that chart of all the reservoirs up right now, JD. Do you have that picture queued with? I do, but I am scared to touch my phone because I think I'll lose all of us. So. Okay. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we've, we've got, um, you know, all the reservoirs are so low in, yeah. in uh, supply right now. I mean, everything's down um, below like 30%, 35% of capacity and well below, you know, 20% of historical averages at this time of the year. Um, actually two years ago, Shasta was 19 feet down today. Um, I was on the lake at Shasta and it was only 19 feet down. And today we're 145 feet down. So let you know, and you know, what, what has transpired, but we're going to start seeing, you know, flow reductions and we're going to start seeing the conservation side of water going into our policymakers. And I will pivot into that to allow Mark to give you updates of, you know, what he's hearing from uh, U.S. Bureau and DWR and the State Water Control Board. Yeah, we are actually. Can you hear me okay, guys? Yep, yep. Okay, perfect. 
So uh, first, I uh, do want to correct you. I am a uh, licensed fishing guide. Um, <laughs> I didn't Blue say you. <laughs> that's Blue right. Outfitters for the win, baby. But I yeah, gotta tell right. you, you know, that's right. a whole other conversation about professionalizing professionalizing the industry and <laughs> what kind of jokers you guys will let in here. <laughs> Case yeah. in point, right here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, what, what James is alluding to is, you know, we're in a pretty significant drought and. Um, we didn't start it from the best of situations. And so the lack of precipitation, really the lack of snow and the lack of runoff that we've had has really been unlike any other water year that we've seen. So for the first time in history, the water board is actually going to propose an action tomorrow where they will curtail the water usage rights of the most senior water rights holders in the state of California. Um, those water rights holders that pull water off of river systems, streams, rivers, uh, the tributaries to the Sacramento and the San Joaquin. And I mean, that's a major step forward. It will be legally contested. Uh, it's a subject of much debate, but I think it just goes to what James was talking about. We have very little water left behind our reservoirs and we manage the system to co-equally provide water to agriculture, urban environments, and fisheries. Um, I should just say the ecosystem at large. And really what we're running out of the ability to do right now is to provide that water for the ecosystem. So on the Sacramento River, the case in point is that we are losing the ability to manage the cold water temperatures that are necessary for the survival of salmon runs. And that is a factor of the limited amount of water in Shasta, right? You know, normally we've got water at a certain depth. And so water at the bottom is colder and we can take it out. But now we've got less water. The whole water body as a whole is warmer. We don't have that cold water available to use in the system. And then it's 118 degrees in Redding like it was two or three weeks ago. And once that water hits the river, it doesn't stay cold. So we've got some serious problems on our hands. The Department of Fish and Wildlife has acknowledged that we're likely to lose 100% of the winter run this year. That'll be two years in a row. Um, I'm sure as your viewers are aware, you know, salmon are pretty much on a three-year life cycle right now. And so, you know, we've wiped out two-thirds of that stock in that one run right now. Um, mm -hmm. And water management has always been an issue because... We treat each of these species, we, 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 we manage the ESA for each of these individually without any regard for what that does to the other runs, right? So for spring and winter run, we manage the rivers in such a way that we basically drop the river level in October and November and dewater nearly 40% of the fall run reds, right? So we're always talking about, oh, we need more natural spawners. We need more fish spawning in the river. And then the first thing we do every year is we kill half of those fish that have managed somehow to successfully naturally spawn yeah. without artificial propagation. And so, you know, the whole system's a mess. I'm not going to point the finger at any one particular group or any one particular uh, type of groups. But I think everybody's got to come together to solve this problem. And otherwise, it's only going to keep getting worse. Yeah. Um, we got a uh, question for you here, Mark. Uh, da, 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 where to go? And JD, I can share my screen now, too, to pull okay. those flows up. If, yeah. if um, I want to try to do that real fast so that I can um, try to share with you guys see if you can see that can you guys see that yep hang on let me make it happen here okay kind of hard to see but um okay yeah there you go you want me to bring it in more yeah zoom it in a little bit okay. there you go all right so it looks like we're getting cfs here yeah i mean so here's um if we we're gonna zoom it all the way in oh, total acre feet yeah okay. there you go so here's your total acre feet and then here's your river flows but here's what mark is talking about and i want you guys to oops i'm sorry that is a computer glitch um here is what mark is talking about so you are going to have 7550 cfs coming out of this out of shasta out of Keswick in October. 
Um, it is going to be 5,200 in September, and then it's going to come to 7,550, which is going to go up because this is the end of the water year right here. And the reason this river is going to jump is because the water that was sold from Northern California to Southern California, but they, the Bureau made the water sales, the deliver, the recipients of the water hold off until receiving the water until October which was the new water year. So um, this is the end of the water year here. And they wanted to hold that water back for cold water pool for the winter run salmon. And they wanted to try to hold as much water as possible in Shasta to keep as, as much cool water as possible. So that's why you're going to see this increase in flows. But here's the problem, like Mark just said, and this is going to be worse than any other year because of the way that this has dynamically shifted the water increase in flows to 7550 and mark you can see the chart of where it's going to go to 3350 and so that difference right there is practically a 70 percent reduction in flow well and what's what's going to happen is in late october those fish are going to start to spawn dig reds just like mark was saying we're trying to focus on you know this this uh get natural production reproduction happening which will happen at that point and then you lose 70% of your water. Guess what, folks? Those salmon reds are now high and dry. And it's just, like you say, Mark, there's just so many so many things wrong with the system. It's, it's not even funny. Yeah, I mean, we operate water in the state of California on a seniority basis. And uh, it doesn't really matter where in the state you are. If you've got a senior water rights claim, you know, you're typically receiving a pretty full allocation, no less than 75%, uh, even in a bad year. Uh, you could be located right next to somebody who's got a junior water right, and you've got water that year and that person doesn't. Again, the action that the board will contemplate tomorrow is unique in that they're gonna go after what are called pre-1914 water rights. So those are some of the oldest water rights in the state of California. I learned a new term this week. There are water rights that date back to 1883. Usually we go to 1914 as like the oldest of the water rights. Before that or after that is the defining line. And um, you know They're going after a very specific type of water user, the water user that pulls their water again out of the rivers and the streams. If you're a water user that relies on water that's been stored behind one of the dams, you're not the target of this action because the assumption is that your water is already stored and it's already behind the dam. So pulling it from the dam won't affect the flow in a river or a stream. Although we all know that that's you know, not always, that's not exactly what happens because that water has got to get released from the dam and then run down the rest of the Sacramento River into the Delta and out to the ocean. So, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's going to be an interesting situation to see what the water board does. But again, this is just one dynamic variable in what's happening. Um, we're not getting enough fish returning to the rivers on an annual basis. The goals that the federal government sets for fish returning to the river have not been met in 11 of the last 14 years. The river temperatures are so high that we've taken to moving more of these fish from the hatcheries to the ocean by truck. Uh, I don't know much about fish. I, I know a lot about bluegills, but I don't know much about fish, salmon. But I will tell you that I'm pretty sure that they don't just hatch from their eggs and then hail a taxi and go down to the San Francisco Bay, right? So by putting them in a truck and delivering them down to the ocean, you're having an impact on that fish's ability to return back to its point of origin. Um, and, you know, we're also holding these fish because we're growing fewer fry and more smolts. And so we're holding these fish longer. But now we've got climate change, which is coming along and making it hotter earlier and earlier and dropping flows earlier and earlier. So we're moving in two completely different directions. We want to hold fish longer. But the climate's telling us that that is something that's probably going to be untenable in the long term. So there are a lot of variables at play here, a lot of stakeholders. And um, you know, NorCal Guides is the only organization that's really got its eye on what's happening in the river. So your voice at the table is particularly important. The marine guys, you know, all they want is fish out in the ocean. And then enough fish coming back to the hatchery so enough eggs can be spawned and enough fish can be put back in the ocean, right? So everybody's got their eye on a different part of this eco web. 
uh, and you guys are the ones keeping your eyes on the river. Um, so Tony Johnson uh, asks you, Mark, are the states of Oregon and Washington seeing similar flow supplies and how are they addressing concerns? Yeah, so the drought is one that is affecting the entire western part of the United States. Um, and, you know, uh, here's one simple fact about how Oregon and Washington are addressing this issue in a way that California isn't. They're producing more fish. So the states of Washington and Oregon produce more fish out of their hatcheries than the state of California does. And yeah. there are calls for the expansion of hatchery fish programs in places like Washington uh, to over to close to 50 million fish a year. Now, part of that is predicated on the fact that fish are part of the food web for a number of different species, including endangered uh, killer whales. Uh, okay. the southern resident killer whales. And so we're just not producing enough food for that species to survive, let alone for the recreational and commercial harvest that wants to take place. So, you know, right off the bat, Tony, I tell you what those states are doing different is they're just managing differently. Um, and their departments of fish and wildlife manage the in-river species and the in-river fisheries different than we do as well. But you're right that the issues we're seeing with water and temperatures are not unique to the state of California. This is an issue that's happening across the West and particularly along the West Coast. Yeah. Mark, are you hearing anything about, I'm hearing light chatter right now about a possibility of a real dry solstice um, I'm hearing. Are you hearing anything from that from any of your water groups or any of your other groups that you work with or are there concerns of long-term or longevity of this drought or what are you hearing on this? Well, I mean, droughts typically come in cycles. Um, we're hearing, we're starting to see with some confidence, another La Nina system developing out in the ocean, which usually predicts a, a, a milder and more dry winter. Um, I really hope that that's not the case, but but I'm not a meteorologist. I, I'm not going to sit here and I'm a lobbyist, right? I can tell you what the legislature is thinking, but not what the weather is going to do. But droughts come in cycles. And the last one we had lasted basically from the very end of 2013 into 2014, 15 and 16 before it broke. Um, and then you'll remember we had like one of the wettest years on record, right? I mean, this is this is the dichotomy of what California is going to be like. We are going to get more and more of our precipitation as rain instead of snow. And so there we are losing the snowpack and the runoff that we just get gradually over the course of the year. And when that rain does happen, it's going to create massive flooding because downstream of the dams, we don't have any way to control it. So you know, it, it, we're going to be going from these extreme conditions on one hand to the other hand with pretty regular frequency. Uh, I am afraid that we're probably going to have a, an, a less than average precipitation winter. I think that that's going to be devastating to us in 2022. And I don't even want to predict what kind of fights we're going to have over water if that's the case. Right. Yeah. If we think it's bad now, just think about how right. bad it's potentially going to be next year if it's a dry winter. Uh, you know, and uh, let me just ask you one short question. I mean, of everybody that you work with, with water, um, you know, I mean, how elevated is their radar on how serious of a situation are we in compared to 2015? Because a lot of people keep telling to me, man, we just got through 14, 15, we're going to be just fine. But they don't really look at that chart that I just posted up and start studying hydrology and realizing that uh, we're going to be in way worse shape. Orville, it, in the next 48 hours, is going to go to its lowest level since 1977, and the end of the water year is until September 30th. So I guess my question to you is just that. How concerned is everyone compared to the 2015 drought? Uh, I think they're very concerned. I would tell you that the water managers and the irrigators and the ag organizations and even the the urban water supply district, uh, they all are looking at the same information you're looking at, right? Um, and everybody is trying to make an assessment of where they stand in terms of priority. I, I think arguably health and human safety is gonna be the number one imperative if it gets worse in the next year, right? 
Yeah. What will happen behind that? I don't know because we've never been in a situation like this before, right? You talked about how low the reservoirs are. They were talking about deadpooling Folsom by the end of the summer to pull water out of there for flows for Delta outflow. I mean, the city of Folsom relies exclusively on Folsom reservoir for its drinking water supply. Right. Yep. And so you're starting to run into some, I don't want to in any way um, minimize the impacts on, on fisheries and, and what you do for livelihood and what the listeners are interested in from a recreational perspective. But I think the state is going to focus first on health and human safety and then try to decide how it's going to figure things out. And part of the complication is that our water system is jointly managed by the feds and the state, right? So each entity manages about half the water in the system and they have different approaches to managing that water. Um, and the state water board has been reluctant to step in and curtail the most senior water rights users. But we're starting to see some cracks in that. And um, I think tomorrow is going to be a real sort of make or break moment if the water board decides to move forward. But I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. that's uh, sorry, JD. super interesting. To, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I've always wondered about those senior water rights and how that could ever change because you know, in 1914 was a lot different landscape than we're dealing with here and, and how you can still have water rights that go back to a time when, it, you know, you might as well have been on a different planet back then compared to what we have now. So that's that's really interesting that uh, finally there it sounds like the water state water boards um, prepared to to step in a little bit. But, yeah, we'll uh, see. Invite yeah. me back the next time you do a show and we'll tell you exactly what ended up happening there. But um, look, water policy changes, it moves slowly. We were the last Western state to regulate the withdrawal of groundwater in 2014. Every other state had already done that for us. Um, I think these, if these years keep getting worse, you might see some adjustments to water rights. Um, it's like the Colorado River, right? Lake Mead is at its lowest level ever. We allocated water off of that river at what has been a historically high point. <laughs> and so you over allocate the resource. And at some point you've got to go back and you've got to, you've got to acknowledge that, right? You've got to acknowledge that you've extended yourself too much and you have to make different decisions. That's going to be millions of dollars of litigation and time in the courts and everything else. Right. So. Well, you said a, uh, a word that's been uh, been popping around in my head a lot is over allocation, because as you alluded to just a couple, what was it, 2018, 19 or 17, 18, when we had the the banner banner winner, you know, record setting winner, basically. And we're just a couple, three years removed from that. And here we are um, in this, you know, this, in dire straits, really. And um you think, okay, well, it used to take a, a lot more years of dry uh, to get us into a, a drought back when you know we were younger, and and now it's only a couple of years, and 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 here we are. So the only answer to me is we're certainly over allocating our water, and the the scary part about that is is you can't predict, you can't you know base your water policies on the fact that you're going to get a record winter every two or three years, four years. So something's got to give here, right? I mean, it, it seems like, yeah. okay, if Folsom runs out of water, the city of Folsom, which they're in danger of doing this year, early next year, right. um, uh, you know, that maybe it's that's what it takes to get people to wake up a little bit to this. I don't know. It's, it's just a yeah, scary and that, situation. And that number that Mark's alluding to is um, in that chart that I just posted up, and we'll, we're going to pull it up again, but not right now, but we'll pull it up again. But Right now, um, the California Water Board is expecting to see Folsom at the end of December hit about 145,000 total acre feet. But once it hits 110,000, that is considered zero. They can't deliver water after it hits 110,000 acre feet. There's no way to deliver water to the city of Folsom. So, so that's Deadpool? Is that yeah, what yeah, okay. yeah. That's what Mark's referring to is yeah. Deadpool. So um, that 110 is dead. So if we really, if the model's showing us we're going to hit 145 in December and we don't get rain January, February, March, April, I mean, we could be looking at that. And that's something that everyone would say that you're crazy to even discuss yeah. back in 15. I mean, they didn't even talk yeah. about that, right. but it's on the table. 
Yeah, well, the I remember in the fall of I guess it was 17 before the rain started falling that year. Um, the, the city of Folsom was, I guess they're doing the same thing now, was preparing a barge to put pumps on to pump actually water up from the lake up to the uh, the city intakes, which were you know high and dry by then. And then it rained that October and it you know it never stopped raining that whole winter and kind of saved by the bell. But um um yeah, I mean, we're we're right on the edge here, people. And I I hadn't really thought about it, Mark, until you brought it up. But uh, if we get any further along down this path, yeah. And and, and I, I can't blame the state for saying um, we're going to take care of our, our humans first. We're not going to worry about, you know, fish flows or whatever. I mean, we got to make sure people aren't aren't dying of thirst, <laughs> you know. And uh, so fish could uh, be taking a bigger hit coming up in the in the future if this keeps going. That's for sure. So it's uh, it's a little bit of gloom and doom yeah, right now. Got, I guess uh, do a rain dance. Yeah, we've got people in the San Joaquin Valley who don't have access to clean, safe drinking water on a regular basis. Right, people whose wells have run dry. This yeah. state of California's got a lot of problems. Um, I mean, we want to do what we can to protect the fishery. We got to do that working in coordination with other users in the system. Um, yeah. But at some point, somebody is going to make decisions about prioritization. And the Water Board, uh, to its credit, is is tackling some of those very difficult decisions. And they're going to start with this public meeting tomorrow where they're going to review this emergency rulemaking. And if they approve it, again, it'll be groundbreaking. It'll be the first time that they curtail the rights of these most senior water rights users and sets a precedent for what kind of action they might take in the future. Sure. sure. Hey, Mark, if we, oh, go ahead. No, Jimmy. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, if we could finish with one last question, I know we've had you longer than expected. I appreciate your time tonight, but um, just my last question, um, and you might not be able to answer this yet, but um, how, how are our, are aquifers doing in the Sacramento Valley and our aquifers in the Central Valley? And how is um, pumping going to um, be affected from these aquifers? And could you maybe comment a little bit about that? On um, Because I know that there's a lot of discussion from mm -hmm. some about the worry of habitat, um, specifically in the Klamath Basin for waterfowl and all of the work that's been done for waterfowl. As you know, a lot of us are waterfowl guides and waterfowl hunters, and we care about those, and we try to support CWA and a lot of other uh, waterfowl groups on their mission. But we're hearing that there could be issues with pumping in, their, in some districts and other districts there might not be for groundwater, for habitat, for waterfowl. Is there anything that you might be able to comment on that, um, of what we're looking at in the Klamath Basin and in the Sacramento Central Valley? Well, the Klamath Basin is bad. The Klamath Basin is about as bad as it's ever been. Going back to 2000, 2001, when the uh, irrigators up there broke open the conveyances and basically released the water that the federal government was holding back. Um, groundwater, and we can spend two hours talking about this. I'll just try to make it as simple as I can. It's very geographically specific, right? And so there are places where the groundwater aquifer is doing okay. Um, there are places where it's in really poor shape. I think as all your viewers know, aquifers are these underground pockets and when you drain them of water, they collapse. And once it collapses like that, you can't go back and put water there because that hole doesn't exist anymore, right? It was the pressure of the water that was keeping it open. And there's places in the valley that have subsided 30, 35 feet due to this, the collapsing pockets. Look, the entire state has to have a balanced groundwater portfolio based on the new uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but that balance doesn't have to come into effect until 2040. And I'll tell you this year, the majority of agricultural products in the San Joaquin Valley are being irrigated with pumped groundwater. So people are pumping that groundwater out as fast as they can. For the habitat areas though, James, what we're focused on is getting emergency funding to the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to operate wells to pump water for habitat. We would be just as bad as everybody else. We're pulling water out of the ground for a specific purpose. We're trying to use it in this case to provide habitat, but that really is the only solution. It's a short-term solution. Um, and really what you need there is you need money to run the pumps because it's not free to pump that water up from underground. So 
if we can do that, I think we can generate some water. Um, I'm not confident that we're going to have a lot of water in the Klamath this year. I think the Klamath is going to be really, really bad. Winter rice decomp, I think we're going to have maybe a third of what we usually have. So we typically have about 300,000 acres of flooded rice. We've planted less rice and we're going to have less water for surface decomp, post-harvest decomp. I think we're going to have maybe 80 to 100,000 acres of flooded rice. For those of you guys that do hunt flooded rice and you pay a farmer to flood it, or if you hunt habitat that has water on it, you might actually have a pretty good year. I talked to the California Wild Dog guys, they're clients of mine. 2014, 2015 was a good shooting year because if you go to a property that has water, there's so little water out there on the landscape that all of the birds are concentrating in specific areas. Now in the Klamath, that's bad because botulism outbreaks will kill tens of thousands of birds. But for hunters mm -hmm. in the valley this winter, if you can get to a property that has water, you might stand a chance of having a pretty good shoot. Mm -hmm. So James, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, we are no, trying to get, we're trying to get water out. Um, we're working on that right now. Um, the Nature Conservancy and others work with my clients because the shorebirds are already here, right? The right, migra it's, right. it's July, but the migration's already happening. Shorebirds right. are here. Um, we have resident mallards. We have other locally breeding water birds. So like we need that water now moving into October, November, December, January. So like we're already working on trying to get that water out. The question is how much can we get out and where can we put it? Right. Mm. It's just a reminder to our users again that, you know, wa everything requires water for life. Um, yeah. You know, water is life. And so, it, you know, even though we're all in different industries and uh, some of you out there might be watching for different reasons, um, you know, th there's a huge dynamic of water in California. And because we're in the southern area of the Pacific Flyaway and most of the waterfowl end up in our area in the Sacramento Valley, and in the Delta system, we need to have sustainable water for them for habitat. Otherwise, we have huge die-offs that affect the entire west western region of North America. I mean, from Alaska all the way down. So um, it's, a, it's a serious deal. And uh, we want to thank Mark Smith for joining us and um, for all of his time. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. And uh, we'll definitely love to have you back. And JD, if you got any final comments, and we'll let Mark get out of here. Oh, no, he uh, he did great. Thanks again, Mark. Uh, it's getting late. So appreciate your time and uh, all you do for us. Sure, of course, guys. My pleasure. You guys have a Bye. good evening. All right, thanks, thanks, Mark. Mark. So, yeah. yeah, you know, I think it's a good pivot point to really understand the sustainability of the system and, and you know, how how serious it is. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share that chart again and start yeah. going over flows. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, I thought would that be a good way to close this out. So uh, you got it there. There it is. OK, had to stream. OK, so, yeah, let's give uh, everybody, especially since we know a lot of people on here are. Um, salmon anglers and uh let's give them what uh they we know about what the flows are going to look like we we talked a little bit about shasta or uh the flows out of shasta um, yeah so, but uh just give them give them the the releases release schedules coming up because it's yeah so i'm going to be reading from this chart right here and this is the state water board um that is going to you know dictate you know where we're at but the sacramento river um, in July was flowing 9,200 and now in August, it's going to drop down to 7,850 and, uh, it will then start dropping out towards, uh, 5,200 sometime in September. So you're going to see that drop, that huge drop right here to here. And this is the timeline that we're heavily concerned on the Sacramento. If we have triple digit heat. Yeah. We will be out of cold water pool at that time. And that is when winter run are spawned and, and they just have laid all their eggs. They're just starting to die themselves as adults. Um, their eggs were laid in July and August and they're, you know, waiting for to, you know, hatch. They're incubating in the river and they need 56 degree water through September and October in order to survive. And that's just where, when that flow drops to 5,200, you are going to see high mortality and um, pretty, pretty bad situation. Yeah. And then you're going to see in October um, when they transfer that water out of Shasta, 165,000 acre feet 
is going to come out. So this is why you see this. Look at 1.1 million at the end of the year, and this will be September 30th. This will be the total acre feed out of Shasta. And then the first day that they can open the gates on October 1 of the new wow. water year, look how much water disappears. Yes. Um, 165,000 plus. I mean, here it's only about 100,000 for the whole month. And then we got 165,000. We go down to 850 and then they drop to sustainable flows as soon as they do it. And then you see here, 849, 850. And everyone says, well, how come no water is going to be dropping down? Shasta won't drop down over this timeline. <laughs> as soon as they deliver the water here, then they go to bare minimum flows. They're going to do 3350 in November, and then they're going to go to 3250 for yeah. December, which is the bare minimum, which is you can't launch in the whole lower part of the river. Um, it's all inaccessible. So, well, and um, that's also the time, the, the only thing, you know, we talked about this earlier in the show, but that's, you know, those fish are going to start spawning right there at that, you know, the 70, whatever hundred CFS. Yep. And then they're going to drop the flow. The only thing that might happen that would be okay is if the fish, if it's still too warm and they don't spawn until November, um, then we might be all right. Cause they're not going to high and dry them, but then the water might be too warm too. So who knows, but uh, anyway, go, go. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And this is where they get dewatered is right here to October to November. So this 75 to 3350 is going to be brutal. And we're going to bring bringing that to you this year. The American river is in a lot of trouble. You guys, yeah, um, you can, you can see the flows here, but, um, you're at a thousand in July. Now we're in August. You're going to see 900. And come Labor Day weekend, after Labor Day weekend, you're going to see the bare minimum. I think it's 515 is the is the absolute minimum. But That is just a trickle. And that's going to yeah. be hot, too. Yeah, because you've got to see that September, you've got 200,000 acre feet finishing the water year here. And the new water year starts and you start going down. Boom, boom, boom. And this is where I told you, you hit 145,000 acre feet. And that's about the bottom to where we've, we've ever hit is right mm -hmm. around there for Folsom. So, and, and just so just for reference sake, everybody, uh, Folsom at max capacity is 900 and some odd thousand acre feet. So you're looking at one tenth of, of, uh, <laughs> Yeah, oh, 966 boy. is plumb full on Folsom. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah, it's it's going to be bad, J.D., and this is yeah. where that this is the variable. From this point on in Folsom Lake, if we have a dry winter Ooh. and this number continues to go down and hits 110,000, we're at Deadpool, and there is no zero. There, we, don't, we don't have that 110,000. That is Deadpool, and they will, like, talk about drilling a hole to, to feed the river, <laughs> um, to, for that, for, to keep a river flowing. I mean, this is serious chatter. Crazy. This is serious talk and nobody wants to talk about it, especially with the recall election. Um, and I think that this should be one of the prime topics for all these candidates that are running for governor, because you could eliminate water supply to the entire town of city of Folsom, possibly, because of the way we've managed the water over the past 23 months. Yep. And Oops. it's just shocking. So anyway, the American River 550 from Ooh. September, October, November, December. And you made a living on the, the American comment on what 550 does for you in September, October, oh, you, November. You're just, I mean, you're talking about no moving water anywhere. Any fish that come through are going to just blow right to the hatchery, which is well, I was going to say it's good for them, but not necessarily if you go back to our Unspawn movie. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's pretty much uh, almost unfishable. And, and, you know, if it was 550 and uh, 52 degrees, you know, we could talk. But, you know, it's not going to be 52 degrees. It's going to be 550 and and, uh, you know, probably 70 something degrees yeah. or 80 yeah. degrees. And you can walk across just about everything at 550. It's a it's a it's a brutal flow. So um, that doesn't look good. The feather's not looking very good either. So let's no. go to that one. Yeah, feather. Um, you got Orville up here and you start with Orville Lake and you go uh, here in August. At the end of August, we're going to be at 772,000 acre feet left and it's 3.5 million plum full. Um, you go into September, it's going to hit 727 
the end of the water year. And then they're going to uh, a little water transfers from Orville under the state water project for water sold from Northern California to Southern California. And that's going to drop it down a little bit lower right in October to 696. And again, then you see 700, 700, it doesn't move and it's going to stop at about 700,000 acre feet. And that's because they're putting bare minimum flows on the river, which, you know, is, you know, six, 600 and something for the CFS. And I'm going to pull that up since I'm sharing. Um, and this is what the email that I got back from uh, Orville Operations. It says, hi, James. I spoke with our operations folks. And they said that they're still working out the details on this, but they do expect the flows to be in the range indicated on the table for later this month and into September. We are at about 2000 CFS right now, and that will continue for the next week or so. And then there'll be a gradual reduction later in the month to what you see in the table. The low flow channel for August will be in the 650 CFS range. And I'm not sure yet what's happening in September and whether we'll be increasing to 800 like we did last year. Under our current FERC license, the minimum flow criteria for the LFC is 600 CFS year round. When the new FERC license is issued, the low flow minimum flow will be 800 CFS from September 9th to March 31st and, September, and 700 CFS from April 1st to September 8th. We do not know when the new FERC license will be issued. DWR has repeatedly pushed to have the new FERC license issued, but it has been delayed for various reasons beyond our control. I want everyone to remember something that, um, yes, the FERC license has been delayed, but um, I, um, <laughs> I will remind everyone um, that even though the FERC license has been delayed, that's been 15 years. It's been since yeah. 2007 that yeah. that has been delayed. So that's a major problem. So you're going to see, um, so that's the information from there. And then you've got the Feather River uh, down to the 900. And to the 50, 950 throughout the year. And so that's why you're seeing sustainable here. But Orville will be officially at the lowest point it ever has been, which is going to be 643 feet elevation. And it should drop below that on Tuesday or Wednesday this week. I am planning on going on Wednesday personally to go uh, report live there and look at the lake at the lowest that it ever has been but it's still expected to drop another 20 to 25 feet from there. So that's going to be an amazing thing. And then, you know, you start going into new Maloney's and the Stanislaus and you can see the flows were increased in July to help um, the flows that normally come out of uh, Folsom, but because they had to reduce flows on Folsom so much, the U S Bureau of Reclamation had to deliver water to their users in the central Valley and so it all came out of New Maloney's here and here. And you're actually still seeing higher flows moving into August on New Maloney's. And New Maloney's is dropping down too. New Maloney's is in a little bit better shape than some of the others. But um, yeah, there is still some issues. But you've got some combined pumping, uh, project pumping of some CFS that's coming out of the Delta. And what's getting pumped you can see here um, that you have a huge increase from the 1200, 1200, 1200 that's being allowed right now. And then you have the water sales that uh, will allow 4,350 CFS cubic feet per second of pumping in October. And then uh, back down to 18 and then December will be 2300. So, um, and that's, um, that gives you kind of an idea of the Delta summary there and reservoirs and uh, I'll, uh, I'll kill that screen share now and uh, go back to finishing. So we have some time for some question and answers. Yeah, that's, uh, that's no bueno. That's for sure. Um, oh gosh, we're, we're almost two hours in here. So yeah, <laughs> we gotta, gotta get it wrapped up. Um, so I guess the, the summary is we've got fish in the ocean and um we've got some fish in the river but when the bulk of the fall run come in unless something changes dramatically we're going to have very piss poor conditions for fish survival um also um <laughs> egg survival uh, successful spawning i mean uh, it's it's not going to um um not going to be good, I don't think. I, I, I like to like to be optimistic, but just just based on what you just showed us, the the 
you know, the feather being low. I mean, they're all going to be just trickles by yeah. uh, by fall, and uh, and you know, it's very good chance it's going to be 100 degrees or more, or you know, in that range. Yeah, I said. By Labor Day, by the end of Labor Day weekend, that's when we're going to get the true vision of everything we've been talking about the last three months of what we've forecasted and what we're seeing. And now you're starting to see politicians, state water board, everyone else realizing uh, how did we get in such bad shape so fast? Um, yeah. And there's a lot of reasons. And it was done under the watch of, like I said, under the current governor's you know, allowing to, to, to the water to go where it went. I mean, I know some of it went to users, a lot went out to the ocean and a lot, you know, for, for different reasons. And do you need to, you do need to have sustainable water going out to the ocean to yeah. uh, flourish life and push salinity back. Um, the water contractors that are pumping South of the Delta don't need brackish water into the Clifton court four bay. And so, um, when we increase flows out of Folsom, a lot of times that's to flush the right. salinity and push it back to the West side yep. of Antioch yep. so that they can pump, uh, fresh water down, uh, to their farms and, um, to their, to their municipalities and to their cities. Mm. But I think what people are forgetting is like Mark alluded to and, a lot of people don't catch indicators of what people are saying that are in this industry and sit in hundreds and hundreds of hours of meetings on water in California. And the thing is, is that we could be in a shape next year to where we're talking about just having water for people. And that's it. I mean, that's crazy to even think about. I mean, you they're starting to take away, as you just heard, possibly tomorrow they could be curtailing yeah. water rights from the senior earliest, water rights. yeah from the senior people and you know there's going to be lawsuits flying over that kind of stuff and yep. and and situations but there's just no supply i mean it leads into you know we've got to have as you said better better management but better supply to make sure that we can get through these years because as you mentioned i think earlier you said and it feels like when I was a kid, we went into a drought, but we had enough water for three to four years is what you yeah, said or more. Earlier. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't, didn't happen so fast. So right. um, to keep up with all this stuff, we'll send you guys to ncgasa.org where we post uh, a lot of stuff. And there's a Facebook page of the same name and uh, you can kind of keep track of what we're doing. And, and uh, James is in uh, meetings nonstop fighting for, uh, for, all our uh, fisheries around here. So um, thank you for that as always. And thanks for coming on. I, I got to go fishing in the morning, so I probably ought to <laughs> go to bed here pretty soon. So, um, uh, but yeah, I think, you know, just, just be prepared everyone for potentially not, uh, not a real bright uh, in river salmon season. I mean, it started off good as we alluded to earlier on the, the sack up there, by the canyon and barge hole it's fished pretty good last few days but um and and hopefully that continues but um, that's what we want i mean i'm i'm hoping that we're wrong i'm hoping the model's wrong i'm hoping two hundred thousand fish come back and people mm -hmm. are just screaming and dancing and yelling um yep. that's what we want i mean that's what we're fighting for that's what we're trying to get Right. And uh, that's why we want to raise more fish so that we can all do that once again. But yeah. getting excited over 110,000 fish coming back, the bare minimum is nothing to get excited about. It's yeah, yeah. Um, it's not when you're going to see 30 to 50 boats at every single ramp on the rivers like we had in the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, you had, you know, thousands of fish. You had a thousand plus fish getting caught a day on the Sacramento River back yeah. then. And it was no big deal because there were so many fish. But now we get excited when we catch, you know, a hundred fish opener. It's like, wow, we caught a hundred fish, you know, this yeah, year. Last year, you're lucky you caught 10 or the whole stretch of river. On right. Day. right. Last so. year was the worst fishery we ever seen. And we've got to be accurate in how we report too. We've got to make sure we're accurate because if we're not, and we start inflating numbers just to sell fishing trips or we, start you know giving yeah. these details to the elected officials and to some people um you know we've got to make sure we're getting them the right data and that's why you know that we've advocated and mark has too for electronic logbooks and for real-time monitoring so yeah. that we can 
give them good data that is sustainable mm-hmm. rather than just guesses and people yeah. saying, yeah, I, I caught 20 fish yesterday. And, and if a biologist hears that, he might go, oh, 20, 20 and I, and there's 68 boats. Okay. Everyone had 20 fish, yeah, right, you know, right. and, and that just goes against us. It, it doesn't help the situation. So the make sure, make sure you're accurate in your reporting and working with the fish creel counters in the CDFW. They're trying to do a good job. Yep. Uh, please try to help them as best you can. Um, I, I have dialogues with them and we're trying to get it as accurate as we can. I still think that those numbers are off. Uh, yep. Last year, they said we caught 16,000. Our numbers showed about 7,800. Right. So we know that they're off. They're about 100% off. Um, but we're trying to get more accurate counts so that we can be true to ourselves about what's truly coming back. Because if we keep saying we're catching 20. 30,000 Kings in the river every year, then they're just, Oh, everything's fine. Everything's great. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's not the truth. That's not what's really going on. And there's a lot of areas in the river that are hurting. And this year you just saw the flows for the feather and the American, there's going to be minimal, minimal effort Mm -hmm. and minimal uh, fish there. Yeah. So, well, I think that's a wrap. Uh, we uh, will have to do this again soon and kind of I'm sorry if we didn't get to your questions tonight, but uh, I want to keep you guys up all night. And uh, of course, this is live right now, but you guys can go back if you if somebody tells you about this and you missed it. Uh, it'll be on the uh, on my on Fish with JD YouTube channel. It'll be there forever and ever. And uh, also, uh, I think on Facebook, they keep it up there. So. James, good job as always. Appreciate it. Thank and, you, JD. Uh, we'll uh, we'll be talking soon. I appreciate it. Thanks for what you do. You be bet. safe. Thank, thank you. Well, there you have it, everybody. Uh, James Stone bringing the good info as always. And uh, let's, like I say, hopefully he and I are both wrong and uh, a billion fish come back and the fishing's spectacular. But uh, time will tell. In the meantime... You know, just start practicing those rain dances because we're going to actually do snow dances. We really need snow dances for this winter. So, uh, um, yeah, we, we need water bad and um, anything you can do to help is <laughs> much appreciated. So anyway, thanks for tuning in and we will catch you next time, hopefully with a little more cheery news. All right. Till next time. See you later. <laughs>